All right, welcome back. So today um, we are going to talk about if statements and conditionals and Boolean expressions. And so, you know, what the heck are those things? Well, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to talk about how we can do or run certain blocks of code when there's a certain condition happening, right? And so it could be, you know, change the background color if maybe you have it, like, let's say like Pong or something, you have a ball bouncing across the screen. Maybe, you know, if the ball hits the right side of the screen, change the background color to blue. If it hits the, you know, if it hits the left side of the screen, make it red, something like that, right? How can we do, run certain blocks of code when certain conditions are happening. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's going to be very cool. And so before we get started with any coding and things like that, let's do a little brief thought experiment. So, you know, what would you do if you're going to leave your house or your dorm room or whatever, and it was raining? You know, so if it was raining, then what would you do? Well, you'd probably, you know, well, you'd bring an umbrella, you'd have a, a rain coat, you know, a rain boot, something like that, right? So we can say something like, well, if it's raining, then I bring an umbrella, right? So there's kind of this if-then structure. And so if the part in that if, in the antecedent, is true, so if, if it's raining, if that part's true, then you do the next thing, right? So whenever the, the part of that sentence that follows the if, if that's true, you then will do what's after the then part of that sentence, right? And so now let's say, you know, if it's really hot and sunny, you know, what would you do? So if it's hot and sunny, then... I make sure to bring my big water bottle or, you know, bring sunglasses, something like that, right? Or wear shorts, right? So if it's um, sunny and hot, then I bring lots of water and my shorts or whatever. And so that's kind of interesting because that's almost like a, a rule structure, right? So you can kind of imagine we could, you know, it'd be a bit silly to do this, but um, you could set up your life according to these rules, right? Where, you know, at some point it'd be, there's so many variables in your life, it'd be hard to do this. But you could just say, you know, every part of what you do could be based off these if-then rules, right? Or you could be something like, you know, if I'm hungry, then I go to the cafeteria. If I'm low on bread, then I go to the store, right? And if anything that we do can it kind of be controlled by these if-then rules, right? Um, or at least you can think of it that way. We don't, as humans, we just tend not to operate that way, you know, exactly. But we can have computers act that way, right? And so we can actually set up a rule structure with that if-then structure and have that control how our programs operate, right? And so that's just like when I was saying before, if we wanted to make it where, you know, there's a bouncing ball on the screen or something, and you want to change the background color whenever it hits the side, you would say if the circle hits the left side or the right side of the window, then you know, change the background color or whatever, right? So that you have this if-then structure, and you can actually use that to control different things in your programs. And so that's what we're going to be doing today in processing. And so, you know, to be more explicit, it's something with this if-then structure. And so what we can do is we can look at, if we look at this structure, right? So if some condition is true, then we do some action. It turns out that this basic structure, we can actually write this sentence structure inside our program. So we will actually type out if, and then we'll check some condition. We'll check to see if that condition is true. If this is true, then we do this action. If this condition is not true, then we don't do that action. And so let's talk about how we can make that work in our code, in our program. And so the way you write it, it's going to look very similar to how we did like the setup and draw functions in the last lesson. And so, you know, before we had like the word setup, we had void setup and then parentheses and then some brackets and anything between those brackets was part of that block of code. Well, we have a very similar structure here where if you want to write something, it's called an if statement, right? So an if statement is something that will check to see if a condition is true, if it is, it does an action. What we do is we just type in the word if, and then you have parentheses. You know, you're used to having parentheses, but with the setup and draw functions, there is nothing in between these parentheses. That will not be the case with the if statement. Instead, we will have a condition, whoops, we will have a condition that we will check, 
here inside our parentheses. Uh, we will talk about what, how to, you can type up conditions in, in programming here in a few minutes. But just know for now, you'll have some condition in between these parentheses. And remember, an if statement is going to be a block of code where, you know, inside the parentheses is the condition. But the thing you want to do if the condition is true, that would be between your curly brackets here. So you, you would do some action. Now, just like the setup and draw, you can have as many lines of code you, as you want in this little section. You can have as many as you want. You can have as, you know, all the fun you want. Um, but that will allow us to actually set up these rules in our program. So we can say something like, um, you know, it'd be like, you know, here in the parentheses, it'd be like, if it's raining, right? And then in here, for the action, you'd say, put on rain boots and pick up your um umbrella. Something like that, right? Um, we'll have to talk about how to write something like that in code because, you know, programming and computers are very stupid, right? We have to have very exact syntax with our computers. But that's going to be the basic structure. So hopefully that makes sense. And so I do want to point out there's these two main parts. There's the condition. That is the stuff in the parentheses. And um, then there's the action to do. That is between the curly brackets. So if the condition the conditions between the parentheses, then do the action. The action is between the curly brackets. And so now let's talk about how we even will define this condition. How do we say what a condition is in terms of programming? What's the syntax, right? How do you write that in processing? And so what that is, it's going to be a Boolean expression. You may remember this. You may not. Um, a number of days ago when we talked about variables, we talked about different variable types. We said that there were ints, there were floats, there were strings, you know, there, there's colors, there's all these different types. And one of the types we briefly talked about was a Boolean. Now, a Boolean, what type of thing is that? Well, it's something that can be either true or false. Now, that's it. It can't be anything in, be in between. It can't be equal to a number or anything like that. It's, it can only be equal to the value true or the value false. So that is what a Boolean is. It's something that's true or false. Now, you may be thinking, that could be really useful for us, right? Because if we think about this condition in the if statement, what do we do? Well, we want to check to see if this is true. If this condition is true, then we know we should do the action. If it's not true, then we know we should not do the action. And so what type of thing should this condition be? Well, it should be a Boolean, because a Boolean is going to be either true or false, because of that, we can actually use that as our condition. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and keep on going. I'm going to give you some concrete examples of what that looks like here in a second. But before I do that, I want to tell you about some built-in variables that processing has that are Booleans as well. And so we have these functions here. Um, excuse me, not functions. These are variables. I want to discriminate the difference between what we talked about in the last lesson. We talked about the mouse pressed function and the key pressed function. These were functions that had a block of code, right? And they would run the block of code, like in the case of the mouse pressed. Whenever I clicked the mouse, whenever I pressed the mouse down, it would run that block of code. Those still exist. Those are still things, right? They're going to be very useful to us. But there's also a mouse pressed variable and a key pressed variable. The difference between the variable and the function is that the function has the parentheses after it, right? So it's like mouse press parentheses. The variables do not. Remember, um, if you think back to when you were defining variables, like a variable called x, there's no parentheses after the x. Like it's just a variable or a name, right? Same thing with mouse press and key press. There are no parentheses after them. But these are Boolean variables that's built into processing. We do not have to define them ourselves, so it's very cool. But the case with these variables is that mouse pressed, it's a Boolean, so it's either going to be true or false. And it turns out that if we're currently pressing the mouse, it's going to give us a value of true. And if we're not currently pressing the mouse, it gives us a value of false. Now, the key press function, same thing. It's a Boolean. So if I'm not pressing a key, it's false. But if I am pressing a key, it's going to be true. And so let's actually take a step back and let's look at some more concrete examples of this before we get back to some, some if statements. So let me clean up my whiteboard markings here. There we go. So let's get to some code. 
I think what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to actually make a new file here. And so I'm just going to start off by making a setup and draw. So void setup, boop, 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 boop. Void draw. You know, we talked about setup and draw in the last lecture. <clears throat> We're pretty much going to have a setup and draw on every function or every program from here on out. They're just, you know, so essential to our, our program structure. Because if you want anything to ever change over time, you have to have this structure. So we're going to pretty much have this for every program going on into the future. Now, in the draw, I want to talk about uh, what I want to do. I want to play with this um, mouse pressed, oh, excuse me, uh, there it goes, mouse pressed and key pressed variables. And so I'm what I'm going to do, I'm just going to say print line uh, mouse pressed. You see, when I type mouse pressed, the variable, not the function, it turned pink. So processing is telling me, hey, it recognizes this. And while I'm here, <clears throat> the difference between the mouse pressed variable and the mouse pressed function, this is how you would type out the mouse pressed function. It's, you put void, you put parentheses, and it's a block of code. And you see processing even gives it a different color. Blue is for functions, pink is for variables. But you can see that's the difference here. Even though they're both called mouse pressed, they're actually different things because... This one has parentheses. Like if I put parentheses after this, you see I'm, now it thinks I'm referencing the mass press function instead of the variable. Different things. Mass press uh, function was from last lesson. Today we're going to talk about the mass press variable. So I just want to go ahead and show you that right now as we're talking about it. But anyways, remember this mass press variable is a, it's a variable a, of a type Boolean. So it can be either true or false. And this will mean that if I print this out, what should it print? Well, it should print either true or false. And the way mouse pressed works, if I'm currently pressing the mouse, it's going to print true. If I'm not pressing the mouse, it's going to be printing false. So let's play with that. Let's see. Okay. So I'm not pr pressing the mouse. Here's my hands. It's saying false. If I click, now it's saying true. I'm going to let go. False. Press. True. And so you can see... All mouse pressed is, it's just going to be true or false. That's the only thing it'd be equal to. In the case of mouse pressed, it's equal to true if I'm clicking the mouse like I am now, or if I let go, it goes to false. Key pressed works the exact same way. I'm going to say key pressed instead of mouse pressed, um, except instead of the mouse, it's going to be any key in your keyboard. So if I do that, it says false. If I press the space bar, let's say, I have to click my window, press the space bar, true, let go, false, press it again, true. Let go, false. So that's how those work. Um, so I want to give you an example of that. And so this is an example of a Boolean. And now we can imagine we can use a Boolean. We can also make our own Booleans. We'll do that a, a good bit throughout the, this course. But since it's true or false, we can use these Booleans as the condition for our if statement here. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. All right. And so, thinking about Boolean expressions, right? It's helpful, I think, to think about math expressions first because we have experience with these. Booleans are kind of new, weird things, right? We are, we're not used to talking about things that are true or false. Um, but we are used to talking about math expressions and things that are equal to numbers, right? And so, you know, you've seen something like this or something like this in math class, right? Where x is a variable, so it has some value, and then you say, well, what's x plus 2? You know, in this case, if x is 0, then this expression is equal to 2, because 0 plus 2 would be 2. If x happens to be equal to 10, that expression is going to be equal to 12, right? Um, and so an expression is just kind of a combination of different elements. So what kind of elements are there? There's an x, and there's a 2. But there's also usually some kind of symbol to relate the two. In this case, there is the plus symbol, which will do something to these two elements, the x and the 2. In this case, the thing it does is adding. And so we can talk about that as well in terms of Booleans. And so if we think about it here, hopefully you recognize what this symbol is. That is the greater than symbol. There's also a less than symbol, right? So an example of less than symbol is here. And so we can think about this. What if I said, instead of saying x plus 2, which is equal to a number, let's say I say something like uh, x is x greater than 100. Well, what kind of value does this expression have? Is that going to be a number? 
Well, no, I don't know what number that would be because X would be some value. And I would say, well, th this, is this value greater than 100? You know, if someone asked me that, hey, Chris, is X greater than 100? I wouldn't say 7 or 20. You know, I wouldn't give a number as my response, right? And so this thing is not equal to a number. Instead, it's going to be equal to either true or false. This is a Boolean expression. And this makes sense if you think about this because x is going to be some – it's a variable, so it has some value. Let's say x is 50. So I would say, okay, is x greater than 100? Well, if x is 50, no, it would not be greater than 100 because 50 is not greater than 100, right? So this would be false. So if I would say, you know, 50 – greater than 100, greater than 100, this is false. In fact, it's going to be equal to false, right? Now, let's say x is equal to 150, right? So 150, is that greater than 100? Well, it is, right? 150 is greater than 100. So this expression right here will be equal to true. So in this case, this expression, if x is equal to 150, would be true. So hopefully that makes sense. You can see that kind of like before when we were in this previous slide, this expression has a value. In this case, it would be a number. So if x is 50, this would be 52. The value of that expression is a number. This is also an expression, but the value of this expression is not a number. It is a Boolean. It's either going to be true or false. Depending on what x is, it will be true or false. Now, we can also, and if you have a background in logic, this will look very familiar to you. If you don't, that's fine as well. Um, but what if we said something like, well, is, well, is x greater than 100 and is x less than 200? Hmm, Okay. Well, let's think about this. You notice now I have I have expression, or excuse me, I have a symbol here greater than, a symbol here less than, but then another symbol combining the two, which is this and symbol. And so if you know anything about this, I can consider this whole thing here an expression. But this whole expression, you know, we're thinking about Boolean expressions, so it's either going to be true or false. This whole expression will be true if the individual parts are true. That's how and works. So an, an and expression is true if the first part of the and is true and if the second part of the and is true. If these are b not both true, then the overall expression would be false. And that kind of makes sense, right? If I said something like, um, you know, my favorite shirts are T-shirts and red. And then I would say, am I wearing my favorite T-shirt? Well, you would say, is, or am I wearing my favorite shirt? You say, is it a t-shirt? Yes, so that part's true. Is it red? No. So that means that the overall sentence, you know, is this my favorite t-shirt, or this is my favorite t-shirt would be false, right? Now, if I had something that said, you know, if my favorite shirts are t-shirts and if my favorite shirts are gray, then I would say, hey, is this one of my favorite shirts? You'd say, is it a t-shirt? Yes. Is it gray? Yes. So there's an and connect, connecting those two, and since they're both true, each individual bit was true, you'd say, yes, this is one of your favorite shirts. So hopefully that makes intuitive sense, right? Um, but a more concrete example of this would be if I look at you know, my examples here. Let's say x is 50. Uh, well, if x is 50, this is false, but this is true because 50 is less than 200. But since both of these are not true, this overall bit would be false. So this whole expression would be false if x is 50. But if x is equal to 150, well, 150 is greater than 100, so this one is checked, so that one's true. Uh, 150 is also less than 200, so this is also true. So the overall thing would be true as well. So hopefully that makes sense. We can use something like this in our if statements. Um, so we have ands. We also have ors, right? So what if we wanted to check to see if a button is pressed or if the key is pressed? This works by saying, um, you know, if, if either one of these two <clears throat> are true, then the overall thing is true. So and, both things have to be true. For an or, only one of them has to be true. So this would be true if I'm pressing either the mouse or the key. 
Now, and again, we'll, we'll get to a concrete examples here in a second. Um, we could also say something like if the button is not pressed, or the way you would do it in logic is if not button pressed. So you'll get some examples of that. But if the button is not being pressed, you know, if I'm not pressing a button, this is true. The sentence not pressing a button is true, but if I press a button, it becomes false. And so, again, we'll, we'll go through some concrete examples and processing here in a second. But hopefully this is all starting to make sense. Now, unfortunately, we do not type these in processing by saying and and or and not. So let's talk about how you would type these things in processing. And here they are. Here's the whole kind of library of kind of Boolean operators. And so we have this double ampersand. Um, this looks a bit weird, but this stands for the word and. So double amp ampersand, it's the same thing as and. That's all it means. You also have these two vertical lines. Um, for me, that's the key above my enter symbol. You had, usually had to press shift to do that. You may have never used that symbol before, but two vertical lines, if you do vertical line, vertical line, that means or. So you can make use of that in your Boolean expressions, ands and ors. The exclamation mark means not. So kind of like we talked about before, we said um, not button pressed. What I would do is I would say exclamation mark button pressed to represent this sentence right here. We also have the greater than symbol, less than symbol. We've seen those already. Greater than and equal to. So you would say the greater than symbol than equal sign. You also have less than equal to. Now what if you want to check to see if something's equal? Like what if you want to check to see if x is exactly equal to 100? Well, what you would do is you would have double equals. The reason it's double equals instead of a single equal is because we talked about single equals before, right, with variables. The single equal, what that does is it assigns a value to a variable. It's like assigning something, right? But it's not checking to see if they're equal. It's making it equal. So one equal sign isn't asking a question. It is saying, hey, x is equal to 2. You're telling it to be equal to 2. But two equal signs, that's like me asking a question. You're saying, hey, processing, is x equal to 2? And it's going to say true or false. You know, it's going to be a Boolean, right? So if it is equal to 2, to two it says true. If it's not equal to 2, it says false. So that's a very important difference. Uh, there's, I've seen a million and a half, including for myself, people forget to put the double equals. Uh, equal sign, they just have the one, and it messes things up. So it's really important to keep that in mind. You can also check to see if it's not equal to by using not and equal. So exclamation mark and then equal. Okay. And so let's actually, uh, you know, so this is how you type it in processing, right? So before we talked about button pressed or key pressed. You have like here, mouse pressed or key pressed. Same thing here x is greater than 100, and x is less than 100. That's just how you'd write these things. Um, but okay, let's, uh, let's move away from this. Let's get into some code. And we've done a lot of talking here. Let's get to some code. And so, yeah, let's actually... I have some things here. Let's ignore that for now. I'll show you that in a second once we talk about it. But let's do some even simpler examples here. So let's say I'm going to print line... mouse pressed... And key pressed. So and key pressed. So remember, we already did this individually. When we print mouse pressed, that's true whenever I press the mouse, but it's false when I'm not. Key press is true whenever I press a key, then it's false if I'm not. But this, what should this do? Well, this should print true if I'm pressing both a key on my keyboard and my mouse. If I'm not pressing both, this should print out false. So let, let's give this a shot. So right now, it's false. Okay, pressing my mouse, but no key. Now I'm going to add a key to that. True. I'm going to let go of my mouse. Let go of my key. Say it stayed false. Press just the key. Add the mouse to it. Becomes true. So hopefully that's kind of making sense there to you. But what if I change this to an or? Which remember, the or is the two vertical lines, which is those two things. What should this do? Well, this should be true if I'm pressing either the mouse or a key. So let's give that a shot. Okay. Pressing just the mouse. Pressing the mouse and the key. That's still true because at least one of them is being pressed. I'm going to let go of both. 
Well, now I'm going to press just a key. It's true. Cool. Now, what I can start doing is checking to see if this thing, this condition is true. If it's true, then I can do some special code. And so let's play with that. Let's say, instead of saying print line, let's say if mouse pressed or key pressed. And if you remember, an if statement's a block of code. So it's if parentheses with our condition in between it, then we have our curly braces. And then anything inside um, this will be, you know, a code that will be run whenever this is true. And so, you know, what do we want to do here? Uh, let's do this. Let me think about this. So a few things we can do. We'll get more complicated as the lesson goes on. But for now, let's just stick with our print lines, and then we'll get to more interesting things here in a bit. We'll print line. Uh, the mouse or key is pressed. Okay. So, and that's a complete if statement. So if parentheses with my condition, brackets, and then whatever I want to do if this thing is true. If I press play, you see, nothing's being printed out. Okay, so that's different from before. Before, it was printing out at least something. But now it's not printing out anything. That's because what processing is doing, remember, draw, it runs in draw, goes through an order, sets the background color, and then checks this if statement. It says, hey, is this condition true? Right now, I'm not pressing any mouse or key. It's not true, so it skips over what's between these curly braces, and then there's nothing left, right? But as soon as I click the mouse... I'm holding down my mouse. This condition became true. And so then it printed out this line. Now, I'm going to press it just quick. Press it key fast. Oh, I can't tell the difference, actually. But let's start it over so we can see. Do this. I'm going to press a key. Oh, I pressed the mouse. Ah. <laughs> but you see, I pressed the mouse. And now it runs about 30, t or 30 times a second, right? 30 frames per second. So even though it was really quick, it actually ran this if statement many times because draw is looping over and over again. But you can see it printed out this statement. Now that I'm not pressing it, it's not printing anymore. But now if I hold a key, you should see that it's going to print a bunch of stuff here. And you see, <laughs> yeah. And if I scroll up, now there's a lot more because I was holding down that key. And so that's the basic structure of an if statement, right? But now let's do something more interesting, right? So let's, uh, I have some variables here, so I'll, I'll let you kind of catch up with me. Let's say we want to make it, first let's make a circle that follows our mouse. We've done that before, but, you know, we can continue and build off of that. But let's say we want to change the color of our circle based off the position. So if it's on the left side of the screen, let's say we make it red. If it's on the right side of the screen, we make it blue. And so what do we need to make this happen? Well, you know, we need some variables, of course. And so in terms of the position of the circle, we don't need to really make variables right now for that. We can just make it follow the mouse x and y. But we do need a variable for the diameter of the circle. So I just called mine d for now. I also made some color variables. These are going to be the variables that represent the color of our circle on the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen. And so let's go ahead and start that, right? So we have color. You know, remember, I don't know if we've seen this so far, at least in the online lectures. Color is a variable type, and then I just called it left color. So this will actually be a variable that stores a color, and then I did the same thing for the right color. I declared, oh, I said initialize. No, these are declaring variables. So I'm declaring variables up here. That in my setup function, I went ahead and set the size. You can do whatever size you want. Then I initialize them. I'm setting my diameter to be 100. For my colors, I want my left color to be red, my right color to be blue. The way you make a color, if you have not seen this before, is you type out the word color, parentheses, and then your RGB values. So I want red, so I just said maximum red, no green, no blue. Blue, you know, for my right color, I say the word color, parentheses, no red, no green, maximum blue. And so... Remember, have semicolons, all that good stuff. Uh, but that's how you do it. So now I have these variables. Let's then say, I'm going to use, I'm going to delete this if statement. I'm going to say, if my circle's on the left side of my window, make it red. So let's think about how to do that. So if, um, actually, you know what? Before we even do that, let's just have the circle follow our mouse, right? 
So circle. And how do we make it follow the mouse? If you, how do we position it at the mouse? Well, for the X position, it's going to be mouse X. For the Y position, it's going to be mouse Y. And then for the diameter, well, we're going to use our variable D. Let's do that. So we press play. We should see, okay, we have a circle that's following our mouse. Now, right now, it's not changing color or anything. We want to add that in. And so what can we do to add that? Well, now this is where we add our if statements. Now let's say if, and we want to check to see if our mouse is on the left side of the screen. How do we do that? It will be if mouse x, because that's where our circle is. It's following the mouse. And let's see, what's my size? 600 by 400. So I'm 600 pixels wide, 400 tall. So I could say if mouse x is less than, what's halfway between my width? If my total width is 600, halfway would be 300. So if mouse x is less than 300, in other words, from on the left side of my screen, what do I want to do? If I want to change the color of my circle, how do I do that? How do I change the color of a shape? Where I would say fill, and then I can fill a, a color. And what we've done before is we put in RGB values, right? You know, whatever. What we can also do, instead of giving RGB values, is we can put in a color variable. And we've actually already made color variables to do this. We've made the left color variable. So we can just say, hey, just fill it to be the left color. Now, let's just play with this. Let's see what happens. Oh, look. <laughs> I was on the left side of the screen. I started there, and it, it's now red. Now, it's not doing anything when I'm on the right side of the screen, though. It doesn't change to blue. Well, that's not what we want. And the reason is, of course, because we don't have an if statement to tell it what to do if it's on the right side of the screen. Now, right now, well, actually, let's go ahead and do that first. So let's make it where it turns blue on the right side of the screen. So if mouse x, how do we check to see if it's on the right side of the screen? Well, I can just say if it's greater than 300. And then I want to make it turn blue, which I already have a variable for that. That is my right color. Okay, let's give this a shot. If I press play... I'm red, move it over, it turns to blue. So I can go like red, blue, red, blue. And I just realized, hmm, maybe I should change the colors for people who may be... No, and it's not red, blue color blindness, is there? It's just red, green, hopefully. So hopefully everyone can see this. Um, you know, Let me know if you can't. I will, I will adjust this. But you can see as I move between the two sides, it actually changes colors. That's pretty cool. Um, and so this allows us to change things in our program, right? Whereas we... You know, if you want something to happen in a very specific circumstance, we can control that with these if statements. Now, while I'm here, I do want to say this is, we put some hard-coded numbers here. Whenever you put hard-coded numbers inside your program, you should be a bit skeptical. You know, you should probably always have variables whenever you have numbers. Um, and so what we can do is, I don't know if you remember, that variable, the width variable, we've talked about that before when we talked about about built-in variables. This is the width of my window, right? Well, what we want is we want to check to see if we're at the left side, which I could just say width divided by 2. And so that means whenever the width changes, so let's say you decide to make your window bigger, this will still work. So I can do the same thing here. If width is you know, half the width, that should do that. If I press play, I'm red and blue. So you can see that works just fine. And the reason I want to do this, if I kept it 300, but later on I decided I want to make my window bigger, what would happen is it wouldn't be halfway. It would be at 300, which is like about right here. And so you can see it actually doesn't, it's not halfway my window anymore. So it kind of breaks my program. But if I use variables, so if instead of saying 300, if I use width divided by 2, width divided by 2, press play, you can then see now it's always going to be in the middle of my, my program. So even if I go back and change my size to 800, some other number, because I'm using a variable and that variable is well-defined, it doesn't break anything. So we're good to go. But okay, so let's, uh, yeah, let's keep on going. I don't have too much else to talk about today, but I do want to talk about if-else statements. And so an if-else statement, that is something that, so an if-else statement follows an if statement. So you have an if statement, 
right after it, you would, could say if else. What this does is this, and this kind of makes sense if we think about the English of this, right? So you'd say, if this is true, do this. But what if that's not true? Then you could say, well, if that's not true, you know, but if else this is true, so if this other thing is true, run that code. And so what you can do is you'll have like a string of if else statements if you want. So you can have like if you check the condition. If that first condition is true, then you just run this. And then you're done. Then you ignore the rest of that. But let's say this first condition is not true. What else if says, it says, hey, if the if statement in front of me, if this is not true, the one in front of me is not true, then go ahead and check this new condition. Otherwise, and if that's true, then it runs the code. But if this first condition, this first if statement was true, so if this one was true, then it just ignores everything below it. So what this does is it means it's going to have at least one of these will be, be run, but only one. So like if this first if statement's run, it doesn't move on to the next ones. Um, but if it's false, it checks the next one. And if, it's tr if this one is true, then it only runs the one for this else if. So hopefully that makes sense. We'll, we'll do some examples here in a second. Um, but then there's also a else statement. What an else statement is, it goes along, you can have if, else, and you can have like a string of ifs with if, else's, and then an else at the end of that. What the else says, it says, hey, notice that the else, it doesn't have a condition. That's what makes else different from an if statement or an else if statement. There's no condition here, and it has to be after an if or an else if statement. It can't be just an else by itself. What it says is, hey, if all of these above me are false, then just do this code. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because let's imagine we have an if statement and then an else if, an else if, an else if. You can have as many as you want, right? There's no limit. But let's say you have a bunch of those and then, you know, but what do you want to do if they're all false? Because sometimes that might happen, right? It could be all the if statements you have are false. Well, that's what the else statement kind of handles. It says, hey, you know, you said if this, if this, if this, if this. Otherwise, you know, if they're all false, else, otherwise, run this code in my else statement block. And so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this just a little bit here. All right, so what I want to do is give you an example of how to use this if-else structure in processing. So if I come here, I'm going up to a new program here. It's going to be pretty similar to what we were already doing before but it is going to be a little bit different, so I'll just show you what I have here. I'm going to do the same thing where I'm going to have a circle follow my mouse. And, of course, the way I do that is first I just have a variable for the diameter. I set up my size in my setup. I initialize my variable in my setup. And then in my draw, I just have a background, and then I draw a circle at my mouse location, but using my diameter variable. And so let's make it, though, where, you know, in the earlier example, we had it where... It changed color based on whether it was on the right or the left, right? And so, um, you know, not, right now it doesn't change color at all. But let's say we want to make it change color in maybe four different places. Like, we'll split up the window in four kind of vertical rectangles where it's going to be a different color at each little position there in our uh, window. And so let's split it up into fours, right? And so what if I had something like uh, if... Mouse X, because we're only caring about, you know, the circle moving this way, so that's the X. So mouse X, if mouse X is less than, you know, if we think about this, if we're splitting up the window in fours, it'd be something like um, width divided by four, right? And then come down here, and then we want to change the color of our circle. How do we do that? We would say fill, and we could put a color variable here. We could put in just a, a certain set of RGB values. It's probably better to go ahead and make some colors. So let's make some colors. So color, I'm just going to say color one. I'm going to copy this. Whoops. Paste, paste, paste. Rename them to three and four. And then in my setup function, let's initialize these. So color one is going to be red. 
copy that. Two, three, and four. Colors two, three, and four. And then let's make uh, color two blue, color three pink, color four yellow. So that's our setup. We have all our variables made now. Um, but right here, so if we're at the very first part of our window, this should be color one. And let's just click play here real quick, which is red. But you see, you know, it changes and makes it red because it started off here. But then it doesn't do anything else for any of these other positions. Okay, well, that's fine. We haven't told it to yet. But what we can do is now we can say else if mouse x is greater than now let's think about or sorry less than the um the next kind of boundary right so if this is our first boundary in here let's even draw this out so you get an idea about what i'm talking about here so like if this is our window we want to split it up into kind of four sections we've already said that this kind of position here is the width divided by four? Well, if that's width divided by four, what is this position? Well, you may, may be screaming it at your, your laptop screen or whatever. It's gonna be width divided by two, right? So if we're going up by fourths, this is one fourth, this would be two fourths, which is the same as one half. And then this will be three fourths right here for that last one. And then here at the very end, it's just width, because that's that's the width. It's like one. And so, okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. But so now we can say if we're less than this first kind of boundary, fill to be the first color. If we're less than the second boundary, which would be width divided by two, what color do you want to make it? Well, that would just be our second color, fill C2. Okay, now let's just click play here. Let's see what happens. So I'm red, and I change to blue. Now I stay blue for the rest of them because I have, don't have that part defined yet. But you can see I can change at least between this first quadrant and then the, the second quadrant. Or second, not quadrant, but section in our, uh, our window here. Now, you may be wondering, okay, did I really need an else if to make that happen? Um, well, let's think about this. If I only had this, right, and I didn't use this else if structure, so let's imagine I didn't have that first if statement, and then I changed this just an if, because it won't let you have an else if unless there's an if before it. But if I take this out and we see what happens, you know, there, there's no way of it telling the difference between this first quadrant and second quadrant, right? And so to make this work, we need to have, we need to check to see if it's less than this boundary first. If it's not, so if this if statement's false, then we want to move on to this next else if, which we'll check for this next boundary. So hopefully that's making sense, um, because the way this works, and hopefully you're seeing this, is that what it does when you know, it's running your code and it reaches this point, first it checks this if statement. It checks to see if this condition is true. If it is, it just does this line and then ignores any else ifs below it. But if this condition is false, then it does move on to the next else if, checks that condition. If that condition is true, then it runs this one. And of course, we can keep on going. So now if we say else if mouse x is less than this boundary, which would be three fourths or three halves, excuse me, you know, three fourths, yeah, three fourths uh, the width, which would be written like this three times the width divided by four. Come on down. Now we can say let's fill by the third color. Let's click play and let's see what happens. Red, blue, pink. And then, you know, over here it doesn't recognize this fourth quadrant yet because I haven't told it to. But you can see it's starting to kind of work for us, right? And now I can say else if mouse x is less than just width fill to be the fourth color. So that's this fourth boundary of our window. Fill color four, press play. So red, blue, pink, yellow. 
you see it, it's working pretty good. So hopefully that makes sense. You know, we can review this. So what it's doing is it looks at this first if statement. If it's true, it just runs, makes the fill color one, and then it skips the rest of these else ifs. But if this condition, this very first condition, if it's false, it moves on to the next one. And then it kind of repeats that same structure. You know, if this condition is true, then it just runs this and then skips the rest. But if this is false, then it moves on to the next one. So on and so forth, and it goes from there. So hopefully that makes sense. And um, we can also talk about else statements here as well. Else, it works very similar to how an else if statement works. The only difference is, is that it does not have a condition. And so what we can do actually is what if we, for this one, we just said, just got rid of that. So it's not an else if anymore. There's no condition. It's just an else. So what, what this is going to say is going to check all these conditions, and if this one's false, this is false, and this is false, it just will, will make color 4 happen. It will fill the circle to be color 4. So this is almost like saying a, a default setting, right? It says, hey, if none of these other ifs and else ifs are true, then just do this. So that's what we're telling it to do. And so if we press play here, you know, right now that first if statement's true, but if I move here, the first if statement's false, but the second if statement's true. Here I can even kind of put them both here. Where is it? Oh, I don't see the window there. It's okay. I can just move it right here. So when I'm here, that first if statement's true, but then when I move it here, the first if statement's false, This, but the second else if statement, this one right here, is true. Then if I move one more over, this else if is true, but the other two are false. But then if I move to the final quadrant, all the ifs and else ifs here are false. But I go to the else, which makes it color four, which is yellow. So that's how that works. And hopefully that makes sense to you as well.